Hi, I'm Miss Pliskin, and today I'm building a Baroque-style Georgian country house inspired by a couple of different houses. The Georgian time period started in about 1714 and lasted through 1837-ish, and also includes the Regency era. However, a lot of the relevant architecture trends and social impacts to house design fall a bit outside that time too, so don't hold me strictly to those dates. The exterior was predominantly based on Wingerworth Hall, built in 1724, in a more restrained style of late Baroque architecture, where you start seeing the drama and flamboyance of early Baroque toned down a smidge and mixed in with a bit more classical architecture, so it ends up as something like a classical Baroque compromise. It's kind of hard to define Baroque architecture with just a few key facts and features, since its signature is ornamentation. The author John Harris describes Baroque architecture as the rough rather than the smooth, the ornamented rather than the unornamented, the complex rather than the simple. Hmm. Okay, thanks John. Not super helpful in terms of defining the style though, is it? Okay, fine. How about some famous examples to kind of give you the gist of why the style is so hard to nail down? We've got St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, Palace of Versailles in France, Cathedral of Santiago in Spain, and Chatsworth House in England. All of these places all look drastically different, but all fit under the Baroque label. So let's break it down. We need one, a lot of exterior ornamentation, that's clear. We've got pilasters, we've got sculpted reliefs, pediments, complicated roofscapes. It's chunky, it's heavy, it's fancy. Bam, there's your Baroque slogan. Two, we need some classical design ideas. So we've got symmetry, pediments, and rusticated stonework. And then three, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we just need to copy an already existing house and call it a day. Baroque is hard. I mentioned that the exterior of this building was based on Wingerworth Hall. Unfortunately, it was demolished in the 20s, so there isn't a lot of interior details I could find online. Actually, I couldn't find any. So I kind of cobbled together a floor plan from a few different sources, primarily Raynham Hall. Also, I stole this front gate idea from the Jan van der Hayden painting called An Architectural Fantasy Painted in 1670 of a made-up place. And if you watched my Downton Abbey speed build, you'll have heard me say a few times I didn't want to make the build so big and I was avoiding adding a basement. I also chopped off a few stories, blah, blah, blah. Well, no shortcuts here. We're talking full basement, a complete third floor. That's right, folks. This thing is big. It's unwieldy. It is a statement of wealth, which is exactly how these country houses were supposed to be. If you had money, you had nothing without land because you had no power without land. And thus the country house was a way to gain power. Not through farming. In general, the owners of these super fancy country estates did not farm for profit or even really run farms at all. The point of owning land was to rent it out to tenants and in ye olden times, a landlord could call his tenants to fight for him and in later years, he could call his tenants to vote for him. And then they used the rent money to persuade even more people to fight and or vote for him by either outright buying them or by having such a fancy estate to persuade people. This impressive estate would turn into connections, which turned into jobs and government positions, which turned into more money to buy more land and on and on and on it goes through the generations. Voila, a dynasty. And any estate worth anything was landscaped within an inch of its life. I decided to emphasize the landscaping in this build because similar to how architecture styles went in and out of fashion with the English country's elite, resulting in massive renovations to their houses, so too did their gardens. In the 1600s, the fashionable garden was filled with impeccably manicured topiaries, trees, and box hedges. It was a very French aesthetic. Think of the perfectly symmetric gardens at Versailles. Then in the 1700s, and now this is moving into the Georgian period, a man named Capability Brown, and no, he was not a children's book character. People called him Capability because he told all of his clients that their land had capability for improvement. Anyway, good old capability had a vision of the English countryside. Rolling green hills, naturalistic ponds, artfully placed trees, and of course, no vision of the English countryside would be complete without ruins. 
Yes, fake ruins. These fake ruins, called follies, were kind of a weird craze that swept England during the 1700s. They were intended to capture the spirit of nature taking over, the art of man being transformed to the art of Mother Nature. But that's not all. Some people used fake ruins as monuments to anti-imperialist sentiment, to symbolize the decay of colonial England. At the same time, others used fake ruins to represent the glory of the British Empire. One dude imported real Roman ruins from Libya and set them up in his backyard to represent England as the great successor to the Roman Empire. I'm using fake ruins to decorate my pool. Yeah, it's a bold statement, I know. Keeping the exterior pristine was something that the homeowners definitely had on their minds because country house tourism started to become a thing around 1700. You had a lot more people with the means to travel for the sake of travel, and while they were out and about, they wanted to see the local grand estates. It was trendy at the time to keep diaries, kind of like how bullet journaling is super trendy now, and there were a lot of notes about house tourism found in those diaries. But in general, architecture was becoming a bit of a hobby for everyone, so those with means would go around judging these houses with the intent to straight up copy things they liked, or otherwise be downright savage if they thought the designs were lacking. Sometimes these tours were really informal. You'd just randomly show up to some dude's house, tip the maid that answered the door, and they'd show you around. Other times, presumably for the more popular tourist attractions, the houses would have a whole process for tours. They'd have tokens, they'd have servants guarding side doors, hotels to accommodate tourists. It was a whole industry. There were even maps published. Think along the lines of those Hollywood star maps you can get in California so you can drive by celebrity homes, except better because you could often go inside these homes. Some owners were even super hospitable, conducting tours themselves or even inviting tourists to stay for dinner or even overnight. I love taking old house tours, but I had no idea that the concept dated so far back. It seems like a much more recent thing where these country houses are more dependent on being museum showpieces, but back when they were real working estates, people were just as curious to see inside as they are today. Onto the interior, I start with figuring out the stairs in the hall. The hall of a Georgian country manor was an important room to make a dramatic and impressive first impression. The halls of older houses before about 1670 could have been used for all sorts of fun stuff and would have been the main entertainment room for the family and the servants. But by the time the Georgian period rolled around, the servants had been banished to the basements of these country houses, never to be seen or heard from again. Ooh. No, seriously. It was around this time that these houses were built specifically to keep the servants hidden with back staircases, basement kitchens, trap doors, and secret tunnels. Yes, I am so excited about that. I'll talk more about it later, but I build a secret tunnel from the greenhouse to the kitchen in the basement. But now back to the hall. <laughs> During this period, the hall is transformed into a statement piece with emphasis placed on architectural details and size rather than furnishing. In keeping with that idea, I've barely furnished the hall, but I did a lot of plaster work, sculpture, and I added marble flooring and I made the stairs kind of fun. It was more common to have the grand staircase be in a slightly separate space from the hall, but I had to condense the floor plan a bit in order to accommodate Sims proportions. Two-story halls were pretty common in the early Georgian period, but ended up falling out of fashion after the mid 1700s. So given that this house was built pretty early in the Georgian period, I'm assuming there's a two-story hall. And this grand entryway wouldn't have been used very regularly. The family would have used a side or back door, and in a lot of these floor plans, you can see office space located near these side doors so that business associates didn't need to use the formal front entrance. This is the parlor. Later on, a space like this would have been called a drawing room and would be positioned directly adjacent to the hall and would be the primary sitting room of the family. These would be catch-all spaces where the family would hang out, have informal meals, and receive guests. I have this room extended the entire width of the house because at this time it was recommended that a parlor should be located with a view of both the front and the back of the house in order to keep an eye on everything going on. 
The dining room was often one of the fanciest rooms in the house, with dinner served by footmen and wine served by a butler. After dinner was served, the ladies would go to the drawing room to have some after dinner tea or coffee, which started to become popular in the late 1600s. The men would join the ladies later on in the evening. Ostensibly, this custom started as a let the ladies go on ahead and prepare the coffee, we'll wait. But that duration stretched for longer and longer, so the men could get a couple of hours to themselves to drink, smoke, and I don't know, gossip. <laughs> so this may come as a shock to you, but England is wet. Oh yeah, it was a shock to me too. Kidding. But there was a lot of logistical planning that went into keeping these houses, and the bedrooms in particular, dry. Especially since for the majority of the year, there was no one living in them. The family would have their servants air out their bedding ahead of their arrival, lighting fires in the bedrooms day and night, and some people even went so far as to instruct their servants to sleep in their beds to ensure their beds were sufficiently comfy for their return. So, for the bedroom floor plan, I have some explaining to do. Okay, follow me. In the pre-Georgian period, the family spent much less time in the public spaces of the house and much more time in their private spaces, which they called apartments. And since they spent much more time there, their apartments were much larger and would consist of a bedroom and basically a bunch of sitting rooms. During the Georgian period though, the family started hanging out way more outside their apartments in the drawing room, which is why the concept of private apartments disappeared as they grew less relevant and smaller. The private space now mostly just consisted of a bedroom with a separate dressing room for the husband and wife. And these dressing rooms are, yes, dressing rooms, but also basically sitting rooms. Okay, that explanation out of the way, let me tell you why I ignored it. <laughs> I didn't really think that breaking up the master bedroom into three separate rooms would have looked decent with the space I had, so I settled for a slightly separate dressing area. And I know, I have failed you but ultimately I'm pretty pleased with it. The library as a massive collection is just becoming widespread in country houses in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Even small collections of books were pretty rare until that point because learning and literacy weren't a huge thing yet. Of course, there were exceptions to this, but by and large, the lord of a great house didn't need to be well-read or even particularly literate. He needed to be brave and dashing and great at hunting. Oh boy, I'm swooning over here. But by the 1500s, the ruling class was encouraged to, you know, like, read. But this wasn't always the case for the folks out in the country. And people didn't have big old collections of books until a couple hundred years later. Most upper crust families had maybe about like 50 books. So yeah, no need for a library yet. It wasn't until the end of the 1600s that libraries started cropping up in country houses, and even then, they were still pretty rare, and almost none from that time period still exist today. Going into the 1700s, libraries are now pretty much standard. Thankfully. <laughs> I don't know how I'd fill up all of these rooms if at least one of them wasn't just for books. This is another drawing room. I'm calling this one the Red Room. It's not easy on the eyes, I'll give you that. And in the 1700s, people were designing their houses with a circular procession in mind for entertaining, meaning that the rooms opened for an event would be arranged in a circle around and up the staircase. So it's not at all weird to have a living space like this upstairs. In English country houses, it was common for there to be a sort of half basement ground level, sort of half underground, where the family would spend the majority of their time, and this would be used as an informal space with more formal rooms on the floor above. Exterior access to these half basements would be provided so that the family and routine visitors to the house didn't have to use the formal front entry. For this house, I've made the basement completely servant space, which was the norm for Irish country houses. And they had secret tunnels. Yes, in order to preserve the pristine look of their lovely gardens, these houses were built with tunnels that connected the stables and the farms with the basement of the house. And I mean, to be fair, it would totally ruin the whole vibe if they had to actually see the real live people who made their lifestyles possible. But are we surprised that the English and Irish elites were elitist? No, we are not. Whatever, I'm just excited about secret tunnels. 
The secret tunnel that I built connects the greenhouse to the basement, which includes a wine cellar, kitchen, servant's lounge, and a servant's dining room. Building a service tunnel that exits in the greenhouse is a little bit generous. Most in real life would have been more discreet and out of the way. These tunnels would have been used in order to make deliveries to the house and to hide servants working in the stables or on the farm so the exterior of the houses could be viewed perfectly from all angles and any view from the windows inside of the house would also be flawless. We're coming up to the end of the build, but stick around to the very end for some glamour shots and let me know in the comments if you have any building or architecture style requests. If you're interested in art, architecture, and history, please consider subscribing. I have many more of these videos planned and thank you so much for watching.